morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Wood, and I'm here to introduce our speaker today, Daniel Jaffe. Dan's an Ohio lawyer, and he worked for 14 years at Squire, Squire Sanders, and Dempsey. Um, he there represented public school board of educations in Ohio, scores in negotiation with teachers unions and the public sector unions representing non-certificated staff. In 06, Dan joined the faculty at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and there taught two different kinds of classes, education law and contract drafting as part of the Case Arc Integrated Lawyering Skills Program. Dan is now returning to Squire Sanders um, as in-house count, in counsel there, um, where he will return to his um, education law representation. Dan yearly co-authors the West Publication Ohio School Law Handbook, which is a comprehensive practical guide to the law as it relates to public schools in Ohio, and received both his BA and JD from Columbia University. Dan Jaffe. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> they, they told me that I had to introduce myself, and I, being, I don't like to talk about myself, of course, and so I asked Lisa to introduce me. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that. Thank you all for coming. It's nice to see familiar faces here, former students, colleagues uh, from, from the law school uh, and from other places. Um, I, I entitled my talk today, The Incremental Revolution in the Law Governing Ohio's Public School Districts and Teachers. So if you look up the word revolution in, uh, in the dictionary, you'll find that it means a sudden radical or complete change. Sudden radical or complete. It, it also means, by the way, the rotation of a celestial body on its axis. Ac axis. This has nothing to do with rotation on the axis. Um, but it is about a sudden radical or complete change, except that this is an incremental revolution, which, of course, would be a contradiction in terms. So what in the world did Jaffe mean when he talks about an incremental revolution? And hopefully I'll try to answer that maybe uh, by the time we're done this morning. Um, how, how, how many of us are attorneys? Show of hands? Okay, most of us. And any non-attorney education people? A, a few, okay, okay. How many of you have either had or your children have had teachers, veteran teachers that have been in the same school district for 25 years, 30 years, even more 30 years? A show of hands on this one. Okay, almost, almost everybody. And I think that that's certainly not unusual in Ohio. So as context here, uh, I'm going to suggest that the, the most fundamental relationship between, uh, between teachers and school districts is simply employment, be, being employed and staying employed in your particular school district. So if we take a look at some national statistics, I could focus this a little if I could, but I can't. But, uh, but so these are, these are national statistics. This is from the National Center for Educational Statistics. And these are based on 2008-2009 data. And this shows stayers, movers, and leavers. So a stayer would be somebody who stays in the same school district from one year to the next. A mover would be somebody who stays in the profession but changes their uh, school district, and a lever would be somebody that leaves the profession uh, 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 permanently. This is split into by, by years of experience, so the green one on the top, that's for all teachers. And you see for all teachers that it's about 8% movers and 8% levers. So I don't, don't do the math, by the way. <laughs> Because if you got 8%, 8%, and 85%, it doesn't quite add up. So there must, there must have been, whoever did this chart must have done some rounding. But about 8%. Teachers with little experience, one to three years experience, you see the levers are slightly above average. 
but the movers are way above average, about 14 percent. And, and I think that that makes sense because people new to the profession, either they find the, you know, they, they might take their first job wherever they get it, and their second job is the one that they really, really want. Uh, by the time they get to four to nine years, pretty steady, and then 10 or more years, there's a big drop off in movers, which again is something that wouldn't be unexpected. So that's the national statistics. Here's Ohio statistics. This is, this is from 2006. Uh, and this is from a study commissioned by the Ohio Department of Education. It covered 2001 to 2006. I'm just giving you 2006 figures from that study, but 2001 through 2006, there wasn't much difference, maybe half a percentage up one year, a little bit down another year. But this is just 2006. By the way, they're, they're, they've commissioned a new study that they're not released, it's not done yet, um, but that's supposed to come out this year. So it'll be interesting to see if there's any change. So looking at Ohio, and I don't have this separated by years of service, looking at Ohio, we see the levers are right around the national average, but the movers are only one and a half percent as opposed to eight percent nationally. So, so why, why is this? Why, how, how could this be? Is it because we have such friendly people here in Ohio? We do, of course. I'm not sure that's it. Is it because the principals are so good, the school districts are so good? So I'm going to suggest that if we look at the law governing teachers in their school districts in Ohio, we'd find that there's some explanation for it. So here are five areas in Ohio statutes that are disincentives to teacher mobility from district to district, uh, right there in the statutes. So salary schedule, tenure, layoff, pension plateaus, and deadlines. And I'll, I'll cover these one at a time. Uh, and the pension plateaus and deadlines, there's not, not much change in them, but the others I want to cover in depth. So, salary schedules. Salary schedules in Ohio are governed by two uh, basic statutes, 33.17.14, 33.17.13. And those two statutes create the basic parameters for, for salary schedules in Ohio. So under 33.17.14, each Board of Education is required to annually adopt a schedule and that schedule, when a teacher comes into the district, they have to give five years of experience on the schedule. And I'll show you a, a typical schedule in a minute. So credit for a minimum of five years teaching experience or military experience. And that was 33 33-17-13 creates a minimum salary schedule for the state, which every district has to at least meet it says that schedule has increments for years of experience and increments for uh, educational attainment. And most important, from this perspective, any school district employing a teacher new to the district shall grant not more than 10 years. So if you're moving districts in Ohio, you have to be given at least five years, but you can't get more than 10 years experience. So that's, that's the framework we come into. By the way, these, these are all, I'm working under old law. I'm going to show you how it's all changing. So here's a typical salary schedule. And this is from the Grandview Heights City School District. I picked this sort of randomly uh, just off the Employment Relations Board website. This is their salary schedule for the coming year. Anybody know where Grandview Heights is? Columbus area. OK, very good. Grandview Heights. The home of the fighting. I have no idea. <laughs> the Bobcats. The Bobcats. The fighting Bobcats. Come on. Um, so this is a, a not atypical salary schedule. So you see on the left hand side, I'm going to point with this. We've got years of experience, and across the top, you've got educational attainment. So that a teacher would come in probably at the low salary, thirty-nine thousand. And if they continue teaching there, and if they continue to upgrade their educational experience, their, their, 
their own degree, then they might end up all the way at 94,000. So this is, this is the typical grid, and the, the raises under this grid are automatic, not based on performance, and, and they go from year to year. So those of you that followed the, the Strongsville teacher strike earlier this year know that that's what the strike, at least I, I don't know, but I, what I read in the paper, that's what they were fighting over was these automatic step increases from, from year to year. So this one is, uh, they're all a little different. Each district is a little different in terms of how they do it. This one seems to take about $2,000 each year from year to year and about $2,000 from one, one from like BA to BA 15, et cetera. Uh, so the, a first year teacher might get close to a 5% increase going to a second year, uh, and the higher up you go, the lower it gets. This one has a strange plateau uh, from 10 to 11. It's a double increase there for some reason. These are all negotiated. So these are negotiated between the school board and the union. Each one's going to be different. Uh, this, and then there's plateaus. So not atypically, there's a plateau here at 17 years, a plateau here at 20 years, and another plateau at 24 years. So, so that's a, a not atypical salary schedule. Um, you can see, based on this, that giving no more than 10 years experience is going to be a significant restraint on teachers moving from one district to another, particularly with veteran teachers. So I, I'm going to follow a, a, a fictional teacher, or at least fictional in my mind, and let's, let's, call, him, let's call him Jaime Escalante. Okay? Jaime Escalante began teaching in 1988. That was the year Stand and Deliver came out. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. Terrific movie. Uh, and he was a ultra successful math teacher at Grandview. He teaches calculus to underprivileged students, unmotivated students, and they all seem to pass the, uh, the AP test in calculus. He has awards from state and national organizations for excellence in teaching. He does not get along with his school principal. Watch the movie, you'll see. He hates his school principal, school principal hates him. He's been teaching underprivileged students for 25 years because he works magic with them. Just once, he'd like to have the motivated students, but he can't get it. His principal keeps assigning him the underprivileged. He's being heavily recruited by other school districts. And so, he started in 1988, he's a 24-year teacher. I'm assuming he's got his master's and 45 hours of, uh, of additional education. He's making $94,000, that's his salary. If he were to move to another district, the highest they could place him under the statute is at 10 years. So that would be a $22,000 reduction in his salary. So obviously, that's a difficult move to make, given, given the statutes. Interestingly enough, I mean, I'm, I don't know anything about, um, uh, about antitrust law, except I think that in the private sector, if you decided, if, if private sector entities decided we're going to limit the salaries that we're going to hire people in, I think that's a problem under antitrust law, but that's that's the law as it relates to teachers, or has been the law as it relates to teachers in Ohio. So that's the salary schedule that, that limits movement. Tenure limits movement. So tenure in Ohio, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean a job for life. You can still be terminated for just cause if you do something really bad. But what it means is that you don't have to have your contract renewed each year. Contract renewal is a, a whole process. It requires evaluation. Uh, and, and to go through that, teachers who don't have continuing contracts uh, are in jeopardy every year of not having their contracts uh, renewed. So to attain tenure in Ohio, you have to have taught at least three of the last five years in your district. 
So you can get tenure after only three years uh, in a district. But if you move districts, if you move to a new district, having attained continuing status elsewhere, so Jaime Escalante had a continuing contract in Grandview Heights, let's say he wants to move to Beechwood, he has to serve two more years. Now there is a way around this. Uh, a school board can give somebody uh, instant tenure, but usually that happens for administrators rather than, rather than teachers. So, so knowing that moving means giving up your tenure, again, another significant restraint on being a mover in Ohio. Uh, the layoffs. Layoffs in Ohio traditionally, or at least until recently, have been, here's how they work. The, the school board decides what areas we don't need, what areas we're going to cut, right? And within those areas, it's essentially seniority. You take, uh, you take limited contracts before continuing contracts, and then uh, it's just seniority, last in, first out. So if you were to move districts, if Escalante moves to Beechwood, he goes from being 24 years in on the seniority list to being zero on the seniority list. Once he gets tenure, that gives him a little bit of a head start, but once again, you're giving up a lot of job security by moving districts. So layoffs, a significant, uh, a significant deterrent. Uh, the pension issue, that's not so much a deterrent in moving, it's just a, well, there's plateaus at 30 years um, uh, and, and other plateaus as well. Once you've put in 20 years, why not go another 10 years? I, you know, so it's a deterrent from leaving, not so much from, from moving. Uh, I'm not going to come back to this one. It has changed slightly, but, uh, but not so much. Finally, a deterrent to moving is the deadlines. If you're moving from one district to another in Ohio, you have to let your school district know that you're moving before July 10th. And if you don't, the school district can complain to the State Board of Education, which can then pull your license. So you can lose your teaching license if you, so you better decide early if you're going to move. So those are, all, those are all the deterrents. So back to the revolution. Okay, there, there was a revolution, not just in, um, in public sector employment in general, but also specifically in education with Senate Bill 5. So Senate Bill 5, and, and I'm sure you haven't forgotten, but Senate Bill 5 was passed in March of 2011. Uh, it, it, would have gone into effect at the end of June 2011, except for a referendum, and it was overturned by referendum. In, in Senate Bill 5, there were lots of changes to public sector collective bargaining, affected schools, affected uh, 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 all other public sectors, uh, such as uh, uh, an end to agency shop, uh, no strikes, no more public sector strikes, an automatic split of health insurance, uh, and, and an odd dispute resolution procedure for, for contract negotiations. That, that applied to everybody. But the school-specific provisions um, really created a big change in, in, in schools and the relationship to, uh, between teachers and their school districts. So they eliminated tenure prospectively in Senate Bill 5. Uh, they required evaluations based 50% on student academic growth uh, based on state assessments. They also, interestingly enough, required that evaluations consider parent and student satisfaction with teachers in Senate Bill 5. Uh, it required evaluations be considered in compensation. Uh, it changed the uh, layoff law so that uh, uh, seniority is prohibited as, as the sole criterion, and it required a form of, um, of performance pay. So all that, that was the revolution, the failed revolution, and here it is here. This, 
Here's, here's the revolution. I'm not sure. I don't know if that's Louis' head on the stick or Rose Pierre's head on the stick. But I'm going to say it's, it's Rose Pierre's. So that was the revolution. So here's the incremental revolution. Over the course of the last four years, a lot of the items that we talked about have changed or are in the process of changing. So the first issue is evaluations. And I'm going to separate evaluations into content and into procedures. So with regard to the content of, of evaluations, 2011 House Bill 153, an interesting bill. Senate Bill 5 has, had passed. It covered many of the items in House Bill 153 but I think that when they saw that Senate Bill 5 was in jeopardy, they already decided to reenact some of the provisions, slightly changed, and so they took laws that they had passed and changed them so that it wasn't part of Senate Bill 5. And one of those was with regards to evaluation, to teacher evaluation. And so they created a new section for teacher evaluation. By the way, all the, all the legislation that I'm going to talk about is all in your, in your handout at the end of the handout. But um, uh, one factor uh, in the evaluation is student academic growth. Um, so this is going to come up. Student academic growth accounts for 50% of each evaluation. Now this starts in the coming school year. Right? Uh, it, it, if, if you have a conflicting provision in an existing collective bargaining agreement, it comes uh, when that collective bargaining agreement expires. So student academic growth has to be 50% of the evaluation of each teacher. So what does that mean? When available, that's supposed to be the value-added um, uh, criterion that the state has been working on for some time. Uh, so value added, if, if you remember under the whole no child left behind thing, all, all students are being tested and uh, as a result districts get graded based on how well the students do. So obviously um, some districts where kids are advantaged come out quite well, other districts where uh, students are disadvantaged don't come out quite so well. Value added, instead of measuring pure proficiency, the idea, the concept is we can measure how well students do from one year to the next. So if they come in at a low level and go out at a low level but still have a year of growth, that's good. That's, you know, that's average. That's what you would expect. Um, so. So that's, that's, what, uh, that's what value added is supposed to do. This, by the way, and the whole, the whole evaluation change is not just Ohio. Uh, it's a national movement. You probably, you may have heard about the fights over Common Core. This is all about Common Core. Uh, and it's being promoted by a, a national association of, um, uh, of, of state school officials. Uh, and the test for value added is also a consortium. Ohio's in a consortium with 21 other states to try to develop these, these tests. Uh, you'll see similar systems being adopted around the country now. And in fact, uh, the weekend before this past weekend, I was in New York, and the big news there was that there was a similar evaluate, uh, evaluation system that was being um, adopted for New York City schools. And indeed with a chart very much like what I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. Half the evaluation is student academic growth. Um, ultimately, with these evaluations, every teacher evaluated comes out with one of four grades. Either they're accomplished, proficient, developing, or ineffective. We'll see the results of this in a second. Here's that beautiful chart. I hope it came, did it come out in color in the thing, or it's black and white, I'm sorry. I, I wish we had color, because it's very pretty. Uh, but anyhow, on the right, you see the student growth measures. That's the 
value added when it's available. Initially, it's only going to be available for English and math. Uh, and on the left is the 50% what's now typical evaluation things based on observation, based on professional growth plans, conferences, a rubric if you had it. So you put the two together and you come up with accomplished, proficient, developing, or ineffective uh, for, for each teacher. Um, in the current budget bill, the Senate version, there, the Senate version has a provision reducing the 50% based on numbers, based on value added to only 35%. That's not in the House side of the bill. We'll see what happens. That, that'll come out before the end of June. Um, so that's, that's the content of the evaluation, procedure of the evaluation, and I think this is, this is more important. Procedure of the evaluation. I, I put the legislation in so you could see I'm going to follow what it used to say and what it says now. It used to say any Board of Education that has entered into any limited contract or extended limited contract with a teacher shall evaluate the teacher. So only limited contract teachers were ever evaluated, had to be evaluated under old Ohio law. Under new Ohio law, here it is. Well, you have to follow the state framework, but here's the important part. The board shall conduct an evaluation of each teacher employed by the board at least once each school year. So Jaime Escalante, who went 20, say he got tenure after his third year, he went, he's now gone 21 years without being evaluated, suddenly has to be evaluated, right? Because every teacher, including teachers with tenure get evaluated under the new Ohio law. So evaluations wasn't one of the five items that I posted that said, you know, that, that I suggested prevented teachers from moving districts. But here's the effect of the evaluations, and this is where it's important, in layoffs. So with regard to layoffs, Recall that it was last in, first out, was, was the law in Ohio. That has changed. And instead, the board shall not give preference to any teacher based on seniority. So it's no longer last in, first out. It still, by the way, gives preference to tenured teachers over non-tenured teachers. But within those two areas, tenured and non-tenured, it is only seniority if they have comparable evaluations. Otherwise, no seniority, you cannot use seniority as, as the criterion. And that is a significant difference. So, um, let's, oh, that, and that's just coming back, same thing. So one is going out, the other is coming back. Um, we'll see how this is interpreted. There's some questions about it. What does it mean if a teacher hasn't had an evaluation for 23 years, gets a bad one? Does one bad one m compare against somebody who has two bad ones? Do you even have to consider evaluations as long as you don't consider seniority? The statute is not clear about any of these. But let's say, let's go back to Escalante. Remember, he hates his principal, his principal hates him. And sure enough, he does very well on the 50% of the statistical aspect of his evaluation, but he does very poorly on the non-statistical aspect and ends up with an ineffective rating, right? So suddenly, from being totally protected in his district, he's now vulnerable to a layoff in his district. And instead of just looking at seniority, he has to look at what each teacher got on their evaluation scores. So I think that Escalante, when he gets a poor evaluation, suddenly might start thinking about becoming a mover, I think. Uh, core subject area testing, if you're following on your own 
sheets. This was actually the last couple slides, but I moved them because they, made, they more, made more sense here. Uh, this was enacted last year and is another result of a poor evaluation. So if you are evaluated to be ineffective in two of the last three years, you are required as a teacher to take a core area subject exam. So what, what are the core area subjects? It's basically all the subjects you think of, English, math, science, lang foreign languages, government, economics, fine arts, history, geography. So core areas are, are, is, a, is a broad definition. So you have to take a state exam. The results of the exam are used by your district to, to, to create a professional development plan for you. And the statute seems to give some protection to teachers, saying no decision to terminate can be made solely on the basis of a failed exam until the teacher fails three consecutive administrations on the exam. So it seems like teachers have uh, at least two years of ineffective, then three failed exams, so they have five years protection there until they could be terminated for, for poor content knowledge. The funny thing is, that's if you fail the exam, but if you pass the exam, you seem to be in even more jeopardy because, which, right, it's a little funny, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but this is the way that the statute's written. Uh, if a teacher passes the state exam, the district must require the teacher to complete professional development, and if they get an ineffective rating at their next exam, that shall be grounds for termination under the teacher termination law. So passing the state exam puts you apparently in more jeopardy than failing the state exam. In any case, if you get an ineffective rating, you're in jeopardy. And it certainly makes sense to think about being a mover if you, uh, if you are determined to be ineffective. Um, okay, so, so, so that's, that's layoffs. That's uh, something new as, uh, re resulting from the evaluation. Salary schedules. Um, 33, 17, 13, and 14 are still in place, and that 10-year limitation is still in place, except for districts that have signed up for and taken funds under Race to the Top. So for Race to the Top districts, uh, there's a new statute, 33, 17, 141, applies to all Race to the Top districts. Other districts can opt in if they want to, and that has no limit, no upper limit on where you can come in. So that restraint on movement is gone for at least some districts. So here the writing's a little bit small, but additionally I put it in red so you can see it in your black and white handouts. Um, for race of the top districts, they're required to adopt a salary schedule based on performance. And among the things to be considered based on performance are the le level of license, whether they're a highly qualified teacher, their performance evaluations, another impact of a good or bad performance evaluation, uh, and there can be additional compensation for hard to fill positions. So if you're teaching in a Title I school with, uh, with a high poverty rate, that might be for extra compensation. If you're uh, assigned to a building and school improvement under the no child laws, that might be one. Uh, or a difficult subject area. There's a shortage of Spanish teachers, shortage of qualified Spanish teachers. Well, you might be able to get a bonus if you're in a, in a difficult to fill uh, or hard to staff school. So the salary schedule, at least for some school districts, I think initially maybe 400 Ohio school districts signed up for, for Race to the Top, uh, has changed significantly. There's additionally pending legislation. This is part of the, the budget bill I talked about before that will be uh, enacted. The budget bill will be enacted. What's going to be in it, we don't exactly know. But at least in the House version of the budget bill, it also gets rid of 
the salary schedule law. So that, that would get rid of that 10-year maximum for, for all districts. It additionally gets rid of the law saying a single salary schedule for, for all districts. So you could conceivably have a salary schedule for Spanish teachers and a salary schedule for math teachers. Um, so that's pending. It, it by the way, the, the Senate version of the budget bill just came out last week. It is not in the Senate version of the budget bill. So I would be not surprised to see that this doesn't actually get passed. So that's salary schedules. And a third leg on the stool of the five areas that prohibit, or not prohibit, but are disincentives to moving was tenure. So tenure, as I showed, three years in the district. This actually changed before the revolution, before Senate Bill 5. In 2009, they kept that three out of five years in the district or two years having moved districts. That's still there. But to get tenure for new teachers, teachers who are licensed after 2011, the teacher has to have their license for at least seven years. So it's harder, uh, it's harder and harder to get tenure. And the longer it takes to get tenure, I think the easier it is to move, because then you don't lose your tenure by, by moving. So tenure has changed. Um, so that's, that's the incremental revolution. So, so of the items that would have been changed in Senate Bill 5, many of them have been changed incrementally. In 2011, when Senate Bill 5 was still pending, uh, I was invited to talk at a Chamber of Commerce type group about Senate Bill 5. And uh, at that time, the referendum was in process. It hadn't, it hadn't been made official yet. Uh, and I predicted that Senate Bill 5 would fail, which wasn't hard to predict. There were already polls saying that. It wasn't my specialized knowledge about uh, Ohio voters. Um, but so I predicted that Senate Bill 5 would be overturned, and, uh, and that distressed several people in the audience and said, well, what are, what, are we, what, what are we going to do about that? And I suggested that what I thought we would see is that many of the items in Senate Bill 5 would be taken piecemeal. And so instead of a, instead of a revolution, we'd see incremental change in, in, the, uh, uh, in fine liberal tradition of, of changing things incre incrementally. And so we see that evaluation, tenure, layoff, salary schedule have all changed. And I think that you, you can expect to see more of those movers uh, over the course of time. I don't know that it'll show up in the, in the statistics that are coming, um, coming out later this year. But I think in seven years from now, eight years from now, I think we'll see that, uh, that Ohio is catching up with, with the rest of the country. So that raises the question, is it good? And I'm sure that you'll have your, your own opinions on it. Um, I, I think that having all teachers evaluated is a good thing. Uh, there, there, is, there are studies that show that teachers in the year they're evaluated and in the two years after they're evaluated become more effective teachers. And, and that makes sense. And the, the idea that after three years of teaching, you're never evaluated again, um, I, I don't think that, that makes sense. That we've gone to high, such high stakes teacher evaluation, I'm, I'm not sure about that. But to the extent that we have evaluation and can improve teacher performance through evaluation, I think that's a good thing. The value added is more controversial. The concept certainly makes sense. But you know, the, it's, it's devils in the details, of course. And how do you make those determinations 
uh, that's a difficult thing. I, I tried to read through some of the calcul complex mathematical formulas, let me tell you, way beyond my power of understanding. But, you know, so does it work? And I'm sure there will be debate about that, just like there's debate nationally about the whole common core uh, uh, and, and its use in, in the evaluations. So that'll be a continuing controversy. Um, to the extent I'm right, and there's more movement among teachers, I think that can be a good thing. So one of my students who happened to come today, I didn't know he was coming today, but I'm happy to see him, uh, is, a, is a former teacher. Uh, and we were discussing this in my office earlier this year. And he said that, he, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm quoting you wrong, but, but he said that, that being a teacher, the lack of movement between districts was horrible because you, you couldn't benefit from the good things that teachers are doing in other districts. In other words, it's, it's incestual and you only have the people that you're working with to get good ideas from. And wouldn't it be great if we could have teachers that come from other places and share their ideas and share their exercises and, and share, share all their work. So I think to the extent that we have greater movement, it can be a good thing for, for students. Freedom of movement in general, I, I don't know how we can have uh, a system where employees are not free to move. In other words, and where all these, from the point of view of a school teacher, so Jaime Escalante hates his principal. He'd probably love to move and go to a school where he loves his principal. Why would we not want that to happen? So being able to move, I think, would allow students to be, I'm sorry, teachers to be refreshed and to, to I think change is probably good. I've always found it's good. In, terms of my profession. Uh, so, so freedom of movement. And then the concern there is do we create a New York Yankees problem? I mean, I, competitive imbalance and all the best teachers are being sucked up by the highest paying school districts. So we have the New York Yankees school district on the one hand and then we have the Cleveland Indian School District on the other hand. And I think we all know how that works out, uh, although they finally won one last night. Uh, so that's, that's what I have to say. We have, um, we have 15 minutes for, for questions and answers. I, I have to say that, that my, my great disappointment is that there's no bell here because I to hit the bell if I could. Please. Okay, yeah. If you could. I enjoyed your talk, by the way. Okay, Thank first you. question. Since you, if you assume that, you know, you have, for lack of a better word, employee free agency, do you think that would lessen uh, teacher strikes? Like, and secondly, you know, you mentioned Strongsville strike, which obviously hit the news a lot of here. Do you think it affected, mu uh, do you think the people in Columbus heard, uh, paid much attention to that and B, would be, do you think that will speed up the increments in that revolution? In other words, more anti-union um, stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so the first question is, will the changes, will greater movement affect uh, teacher strikes? I, I tend to think not. I, I, I don't think so. I, I think that in, in school districts where the unions are, are very strong and the leadership and, and, uh, and there, if there are issues that are important to the unions, then, then they'll happen. I mean, but, but you need to understand there that there haven't been a lot of teacher strikes, at least in the last 10 years. Uh, in the early 90s, they were much more common. But in the last 10 years, you can count the number of teacher strikes uh, uh, on probably in the state on, on one hand. Um, you know, we had two very controversial ones here 
in in Strongsville and and in um, Maple Heights uh, uh, some years ago, um, but but I so I don't think it'll lessen it. I I I don't. I, I suspect it won't particularly have a, a, an effect. Whether the Strongsville strike might have an effect in Columbus, um, there, there was already, and I can't remember timing-wise how this coincided with the Strongsville strike, but there is a pending bill that I'm sure you heard of to take that note, the, the the so-called right to work or no agency shop provision from, that was in Senate Bill 5 and put it back into Ohio law. So the agency shop says that if you're, let's say, let's take teachers, if you're a teacher in uh, a school district that has a teacher union, and as far as I know, they almost all do, uh, but you're a teacher that doesn't want to be a member of the union, well, you don't have to be a member of the union, but the union and the school board can agree that people who are not members of the union still have to pay dues to the union because they are represented by the union. In other words, if they have whatever conflict they have with the school district, the union is required by law to represent them, so they still have to pay an, what's called, they call it, a, the unions call it a fair share fee. So they, they pay their fair share. So um, Michigan, Indiana have both passed legislation uh, 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 prohibiting that, Pro making it so that you cannot require, um, uh, uh, I, I don't know if theirs applies only public sector, but um, you cannot require workers to pay fair share fees to the union. Uh, there was a bill introduced in Ohio, and I, again, I don't recall when it was uh, it temporally in, in terms of the Strongsville strike, uh, making that the, to try to make that the law in Ohio. Uh, I have no idea where it's going to go, but from what I read in the newspapers, the governor wanted no part of it because he's up for election this year. It was defeated in Senate Bill 5, and he didn't want to revisit Senate Bill 5, at least not while he's up for re-election, certainly. Uh, and, and so I, from what I read, that's going nowhere this year. But certainly, you know, there is a lot of anti-union sentiment in, in the State House, uh, and a lot of anti-public union sentiment in the State House. And I'm sure that, you know, a long contentious strike probably pushes their cause along. I, it, it would just make sense. So, Mr. Barnes. With regard uh, to um, the uh, changes in the layoff policies, um, to what extent uh, can a uh, school choose to first lay off the more expensive teachers? And to the extent they can, can an individual teacher, if a union member, choose to take less to keep their job? Wow. Wow. Well, that's a that's a really interesting question, uh, and if you if you look at the statute, the way the statute is written, the statute is written so that it prohibits seniority as a factor unless you have equal evaluations. Interestingly enough, it is not written to say that you have to even look at evaluations from the get-go as a criteria, only that you can't use seniority. I assume the intent was you're looking at evaluations and you're going by performance, but it's, it doesn't say that. So, so the question, can you say, all right, we're just going to get rid of the most expensive people, under the statute, unclear, really unclear. I would think about and I am not familiar with, with cases on it, but I would certainly think about uh, and research age discrimination and what are age discrimination laws with regard to, um, with regard to layoff, because I'm sure there are cases about that and what happens if, uh, if salary is the criterion 
uh, as, as opposed to anything else. And specifically, in the context of going from salary schedules like we have, where it's automatic. I mean, I guess years of service aren't exactly age, but you know, it's automatic that you're getting older and you're staying where you are, you're gonna get more money. So I'd, I'd really wanna have a, have a look at that. Uh, the second part of your question, can, can, I mean, can you uh, take less salary? That's, you know, sort of, I, I, don't, I don't know where the first part of the question comes out, but, but that's a really interesting question and maybe we'll find out. An, ag an aggressive school district, please. That leads to my question of, uh, do you have an opinion on the effect of uh, this new legislation on the continued efficacy of collective bargaining for teachers? Because it would appear that if you are, if, if the evaluations and the pay scales are, are more diffuse, that the collective bargaining power of the teachers unions is, is necessarily going to be reduced. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to Senate Bill 5 for a moment. And with Senate Bill 5, Senate Bill 5 took away agency shop, as we've discussed. Senate Bill 5 also had the, well, it didn't say no unions, it said no strikes. Senate Bill 5 created a dispute resolution, so you're negotiating and you reach an impasse, how do you resolve that dispute? And so under current law, it's either fact-finding or it's an alternative type of resolution, usually mediation, that the parties agree to. Under Senate Bill 5, the dispute was fact-finding, non-binding, but then after fact-finding, the union and the board's team would come to the board and say to the board, here's why my proposal's better, and the board chooses which one it likes. Um, so under that, under that regimen, under Senate Bill 5, my question is, well, who would bother paying $600 a year in union dues for representation that can't do anything? I think that we're a long way from that now with these changes, and I, I think that there's still a lot to negotiate. Um, that said, uh, um, when, when the legislature makes these changes statutorily, the way they do it, and I'm sorry, I'll back up for just a minute, uh, traditionally, you can collect a bargain around state law. So if, if, you, if the parties to a collective bargaining, a public sector collective bargaining agreement don't like a state law, they can negotiate and their contract prevails over state law. All of these changes that I've discussed specifically stay, say in the statute that they prevail over any conflicting provision in a collective bargaining agreement. So this is the basis and then anything you're going to bargain for is going beyond the basis. This can't be changed. You can go, you can go beyond that and, and give, um, give more meaning to this, this basis, if you will. I think there's a lot to talk about uh, in, in terms of, still in terms of the evaluation, there's a lot to talk about uh, in, in all these areas, and so I think that um, the unions, unless we go back to a Senate Bill 5 type situations, uh, I think the unions are not obsolete uh, at, at all. Kurt. Nice job. Oh, um, thank you. And I, I, the question is, are you a mover from, uh, are you a mover from teaching at the law school or are you a lever or what? I, I, I'm <laughs> actually, uh, from, I'm not a lever. Uh, I'm okay. not a lever. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm taking a, um, I'm taking a leave of absence from the law school. I'm, re I'm retaining my appointment at the law school. Uh, I'm taking a leave of absence and I'll be teaching, I'll be working uh, as of counsel at Squire Sanders for, okay. for, for, well, a, for a stretch. Uh, I'm sad if you're leaving because you're a good teacher. Oh, thank uh, you. 
But I, I had a question more about policy issues and a little bit off point, but you know, the Brookings Institution did a study a couple years ago about the amount of money that Ohio spends on education, K through 12. And we were rated, uh, I think, eighth in the money we spent in K through 12 education. But if you take out administration, we rated 47th. And in terms of somebody who's concerned with having talent to fill the jobs here in this county, we need to be able to spend more money on education. We have so many districts. So policy-wise, these people that are doing all these changes in policy-wise to impact unions, is anybody looking at policy-wise how you could reduce administration through reducing districts? Um, I, I'm not familiar with the, the studies, but um, uh, here, here's one thing I will say related to, to your question. A big part of what administrators have to do, at least at the building level, is evaluate teachers. And when we go from a system where only teachers on limited contracts are up, who are up for renewal have to be evaluated, and no tenured teacher has to be evaluated. When we move from that to a system where all teachers in the district have to be evaluated, you have exponentially increased the workload on your administrators, right? And so suddenly, administrators have to spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time working on evaluations. Um, so. That's, that's where this evaluation thing is, is going. Uh, and, uh, and I certainly, it, part, part of that law also, you can contract out your evaluation. And, you know, I don't, I don't know how well that'll fly. But, uh, but this is going to require a significant increase in, uh, uh, in time. So anyhow, it's, we've, we've uh, finished our hour, so you can all get your CLE credits. I can get mine too, which is a doubly good thing. Um, thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>